Ladies and gents, welcome to the first GeoTalk for 2021. It's fantastic to see all of you in the audience, around about 25 people already. Uh, don't forget that this talk is also broadcast uh, live on YouTube uh, right now. So I'm sure there's, a, there's an audience watching us on YouTube. So welcome to that audience as well. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, as usual, thank you to John Hancocks and the CCIC group for sponsoring the GeoTalks. It really is uh, appreciated. We're still operating in the online mode, as you can see, um, but I think this is, a, this is a wonderful way to communicate really exciting geoscience that's happening, um, not only in South Africa, but all around the world, as you'll see in this talk tonight. So uh, thank you all once again for joining us and welcome to Jagamoy. Jagamoy Jada from uh, the Evolutionary Studies Institute at Wits University. He's joining us tonight to give us a talk on the paleo mesoarchean record of the Singbum Kraton in India, a window into early Earth processes. So I'll just introduce Jagamoy very briefly. Uh, prior to starting his PhD, which he completed at the University of Johannesburg, he served in uh, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation in India as a well site geologist and a micropaleontologist for four years. And he then joined uh, UJ in 2016 to complete his PhD, which is the subject of his talk tonight. And he's now at the Evolutionary Studies Institute here at WITS for a postdoc working with Professor Pierre Durant um, and continuing um, work on early evolution of life. Uh, I'm sure both in South Africa as well as in India. So Jagamoy, it's great to have you. Thank you for offering to give the first geo talk of the year. We have about 30 Thank people you. in the audience. And Jagamoy, I'm gonna stop my screen share and yep. ask you to share your screen. Okay, just a moment I will share. And just before you start Jagamoy, while you're getting it all set up, I'll just remind the audience that you can ask questions at any time, simply by typing it into the, into the Q&A window and Jagamoy will then deal with that at the end of the talk as usual. And at the end of the talk, you can also raise your hand and we'll have a good discussion uh, at the end of the talk. So Great. Jagamoy, I can am see I... your screen and it's over to you, go for it. Grant, am I audible? Yes, you are audible, definitely. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can see your video feed as well. Okay. So, yeah, good evening. To... Okay. So, good evening to all, and thank you, Grant, for the invitation and School of Geosciences at WITS. I am grateful for this invitation, and uh, together with my colleagues, as listed here, I'm Jagunmay Joddal. We will be presenting some of the earliest evidence of supracrustal rock sequence from the Singum Triton of India, and how this uh, paleo to Mesoarchian rock record can be used as a window into earlier history. This photograph, as you can see, was taken a few days ago while I was in the field in the Singum Triton. As you can see, the pond is booming with lotuses, much similar to this photograph, the Singum geologies endowed with rich geology, and that will be showcased in this talk today. So not much of the earlier history is preserved. And uh, some places on earth, we see ancient rocks. In terms of ancient rocks, I mean to say Eoarchean to Archean rocks. And the rock record from Iswa supercrustal bed are so shown to show some Eoarchean rocks and the Nuba Gitu supercrustal belt as well. But these rocks are of high grade metamorphism and they don't preserve as much of pristine rocks as we find in other greenstone sequences. And therefore, we have seen tremendous amount of research conducted on the Barbican greenstone belt from South Africa and Pilbara Graton, where there are beautifully preserved greenstone sequences and that has been major focus of research for several decades. But for today's talk, we will be highlighting the Singum Graton of India, where we have greenstone sequences, and together with that, we have Mesoarchian Cretonic cover successions. 
So here, I would like to highlight that our early earth, when we imagine everybody, a picture comes to us in front of everyone is that we imagine it to be very chaotic. And the early phase, as I've mentioned, is preserved in Iswa and also in, in Nuva Vitu with some evidence of the crust, but the formation is strong. Nevertheless, people have worked on these rocks and they have argued for chemical signatures of life. Much of the Hadean history, we do not see in terms of any crust that is preserved, but somehow there are zircons that are discovered and there are zircons such as the famous Jekyll zircons from Western Australia, a very recent discovery from Singum Creton and the Barberton Greenstone Belt also preserve some of the ancient zircons, which are record of at around the Hedian to Eartian timescale. Nevertheless, more, uh, more talk of uh, discussion for today would be on the Paleoartian timescale, which is shown here in this uh, time period scale. And where I will be discussing about earlier crusty processes with the inhabitants that early life were using during the Archean. And I would imagine that the early life in both South Africa and India, as we have a strong geological history and a strong bonding with our crusty processes that are almost similar, which I will demonstrate through today's talk, were suitable for the conditions for life to exist. Having said this, it is never easy to understand the Archean or the Archean history. Here I would like to imagine if somebody wants to try to decipher the beautiful eyelashes from the photograph of a Mona Lisa. And this Mona Lisa say, for instance, it got old and this old photo was crumpled or thrown away somewhere and somebody tried to discover the same eyes as it was in the first place. It is quite difficult to discover and again, retrace that history back. Likewise, the discovery or uh, the ancient cretons, as in together, the reconstruction of the geological history becomes very challenging. And that is what we are subjected to as earlier geoscientists, where we have daunting tasks to decipher this kind of pristine signals. Nevertheless, to come to our rescue are greenstone successions. So, Paleoarchean greenstone successions, as is shown on the left hand side, are very unique uh, rock assemblages and why they are unique and why they are window into our early earth, mostly that will be discussed to a major portion of today's discussion. So Paleoarchean greenstone sequences, as I've shown here, are mostly made up of submarine mafic volcanic rocks. To the right is a photograph of a chloride sheet, which is mostly made up of chloride, chemolite, and chemolite, and the green coloration is derived from this mineral assemblages. And together with this uh, mafic volcanic rocks or submarine volcanic rocks, we have abundance of carbonaceous dirt, some silicic plastic rocks. And with that, we have numerous granitoid and granites that are intrusive into these greenstone sequences. And the green schist passes is very prominent in across all the greenstone terrain. So when one tries to understand greenstone sequels, the photograph of the Kapval Creton from our home starts to pop up. And because of the ancient history and decades of research on the Barberton Greenstone Belt, which is exposed in the eastern part of the Kapval Creton and is a classical greenstone terrain, this greenstone belt is a major discussion for many earlier geoscientists. What comprises the Barberton Greenstone Belt is, as I've mentioned, mostly made up of the submarine mafic, ultramafic volcanic rocks, which makes up the lowermost pile of the volcanic uh, pile of rocks, which is shown here in the geological map, green color. Followed by that, we have light green colored thick tree groups. These are some sedimentary silicy plastic rocks, which are younger in age. And on top of that, we have the Moody's group, which is shown here in yellow coloration. And of course, for the geological audience and the geologists from South Africa, this geology is very, very pristine. And we all love to go there and visit the places. There are also beautiful uh, bathlets and intrusive nices that are intrusive into this Queenstone sequence. And for the international audience, I want to highlight that the Bar Barberton Makhanswa Mountains was recently 
designated as a world UNESCO heritage site because of its pristine geology. So these are important features that we encounter or that was discovered from the Barberton Greenstone Belt. So now when we move to the Singbomu Craton, what we see is that we have we have a cratonic nucleus in the eastern part of India. Now we have this map of the Singbomu Craton, which is shown here in pink coloration, mostly the pink colored portions are showing granitoid gneisses, and the green colored portions are showing the uh, greenstone slivers. So we have greenstone slivers exposed in the southern part of the Singbomu Craton, and we have greenstone sli slivers from the northern part and also some to the southeastern part, which will be discussed in the later half of the discussion today. Otherwise, we have cratonic cover sequences which are exposed in the western part of the Singum Craton, and that will form a major part of the second half of today's talk. So, what are the salient features of, of the Singum Craton? Mostly we have granite greenstone terrains dating back to as old as 3.53. We have preservation of Paleoarchean volcano sedimentary sequence from the northeast, from the south, and from the south southeast. And then we have cratonic cover sequence, which are much younger, close to about 3 billion years from the western part of the Singum Craton. Now for today's talk, again, the highlight of the discussion is much of the work that I conducted during my PhD with Axel in the Singum Craton, and that is from the southern part of the Singum. Now the Singum Craton in the southern part is mostly made up of greenstone sequence as is shown, and also we have uh, yellow patches in this map, which is shown here in a large map view. Now this yellow and the green slivers the yellow color is mostly representative of sandstone, which are much younger. And the intrusive granitoids are mostly shown here in pink, while these greenstone slivers are shown here in green. The purple color patches are mostly representative of younger ultramafic complexes, which are intrusive into this entire granite greenstone plain and also the quartzites. This is the enlarged and more uh, detailed map of the Daikari greenstone belt where I conducted my PhD thesis. And uh, as you can see, these are different <laughs> colorations for different rock types, and which are shown here in the Badam Pahar group rocks, which are exposed in the Daitari area. So the lowermost pile of the Badam Pahar group is largely made up of automatic mafic volcanic rocks, which is shown here in the map in green color. And followed by that, we have the Dalbada felsic volcanic rocks, which is shown here in this coloration in the map. And followed by the Talpada Felsic Volcanic Rocks, we have siliciclastic turbidite of the Sindhu Mundi Formation, which is shown here in this coloration here in the map. After that, we have the orthochemical sedimentary suit of the Tonka Formation, which is shown here in light pink and red coloration in the map. This forms a major orthochemical suit of rocks towards the upper part of the stratigraphy. And on top of everything, the Talangi formation, which is shown here as in light green color patch in the geological map, is largely made up of submarine mafic volcanic rocks. Otherwise, there are also evidence for Kumatia lava flows in this topmost Talangi formation. And on top of the greenstone sequence, we have an unconformity, and the unconformity is, um, uh, is overlain by the Mahagiri quartzites, which are dated at around 3.0 billion years. Now to talk about the different volcanic rocks that we find in the Daitari belt, what are these volcanic rocks that we see? Most importantly, we see Kumatiite. This is a beautiful photograph of a spinifex texture Kumatiite, which is shown here from the Daitari belt. And otherwise, we have abundance of pillow basalts. These are submarine mafic volcanic rocks, which are shown here. These are large bulbos, pillow basaltic rocks. This is a hammer to show the scale of the gigantic pillows. Overall, the succession consists of ultramafic mafic rocks together with spinifex texture, ultramafic homotiate basalt. Now, after the Volcanic sequence of the Komatiites uh, and uh, and Mafic volcanic rocks. We have the Talpada formation. Otherwise, we have the deep water turbidites, as I've mentioned, from the Sindhu Mundi formation. 
So this is an example of the derivative sequence, which is preserved in the Sindhu-Mundi formation. Now the bottommost part is represented by the conglomerates, which are derived from the erosion of this Talpada formation classic volcanic rocks. Most of the class are derived from the underlying Talpada volcanics. And then we have sediments such as sandstone and the topmost part of the Boma sequence, which is preserved by very fine grained shale. Now this classical tectonic sequence is preserved for the Sindhurumundi formation in different parts, but most importantly towards the southern part, it is beautifully preserved. Apart from the classic rocks, we have enormous uh, units which are preserved of, uh, preserved with banded black and white chairs. As I've mentioned, they are of this variety, banded nature. And then we have iron formation, which forms a major rock assemblage towards the upper part of the dietary greenstone belt. Most importantly, the age of the dietary greenstone belt was determined by dating the Talvada formation plus its volcanic rocks. We used uh, UPP zircon and we conducted shrimp and also laser ablation ICPMS analysis to determine the age of this greenstone sequence. Here, the rocks dates back to at around 3.51 billion years which is also the same that was dated by previously reported from Ukwaza et al. in 2008. So, the, so this age is also significant because there are several intrusions of felsic seals which are intruding into the lowermost pie of the other mafic, mafic suit of the Kalisaga formation, which is forming the basal volcanic pile. And that's how we know that the oldest rocks of the dietary belt are older than the Dalpara formation, which is 3.51. Thereafter, the Sindhurumundi clastics were also dated. And this is one example of the clastic rock. This is a gravity with rework class and quartz, which are volcanic in origin. These are angular volcanic quartz. Together with that, we have shale site matrix. And we have accessory minerals such as zircon. Now, these zircons were used for dating. And the dates that were obtained were identical and indistinguishable from the dates that were obtained for the felsic volcanic rocks of the Talbada formation. They were dating to back to 3.51 billion years. However, we also observed some semi-crystic zircons that were dating to 3.53 billion years. Now the age of the deposition was determined to be much younger from the deposition from the volcanic rocks, which is 3.51. So the maximum depositionary age is tentatively younger than 3.51. Now we conducted lutetium hafnium isotope analysis on the zircons. And as you can see, these are prismatic, long prismatic zircons, as is very evident from its shape. It's derived from the underlying felsic volcanic rocks with a very high thorium uranium content. And the epsilon hafnium composition of it shows mostly chondritic values, which is shown here in this plot. Now, for this, we argued that the close chondritic nature or the uh, close chondritic values are suggestive of a felsic juvenile source. So this will be also discussed in the preceding slides where we discuss the uh, next Princeton belt, which is the Guru Mauritian Princeton belt. And we will also uh, see how the felsic volcanic rocks and the detrital zircons from the dietary belt match with our data. Most importantly, we also conducted geochemical analysis. And for today's talk, I will be able to highlight only few of the geochemical studies that were done during my PhD. So the first of its kind is that we try to understand how the Kumartiates, basalts, and the and the felsic volcanic rocks the plot. So for which I use chromium over thorium and thorium over scandium. Now this is a very excellent uh, discriminant diagram where we can see Kumartiates can be distinguished from felsic volcanic rocks and also basalts based on the content of chromium and high content of thorium and scandium in case of felsic volcanic rocks. So because of their enormous high enrichment of chromium, commodities plot close to here and felsic volcanic rocks plot close to the right hand side of, of this plot. Whereas basalts girdle somewhere in between. And from here is a clue to say another important suggestion that how the 
Sindurimundi Mundi classic formation was derived from the erosion and reworking of these deltic volcanic detritus of the Kalpada formation. As you can see, this is average humatiite composition and average basaltic composition and average desitic composition. So for most of the shales that are studied based on the geochemistry girdle around the average day site, again indicating to the fact that they were largely sourced from the erosion and reworking of the felsic volcanic rocks of the underlying Kalbada formation. Now, apart from the geochemistry, I also conducted very detailed petrographic work, and from which I would like to emphasize a few of the slides for the initial part of today's discussion. So the first example is the sprinkly layered lamina, mostly made up of carbonaceous matter and carbonaceous globules. Very importantly, these kind of globules are also regarded to be chemoautotrophic clots, which were described by Westel et al. from the Barberton Griston Belt. And they are reworked microbial mat like laminations, which are studied from the dietary belt, which are entrained within siliceous carbonaceous matrix. And these are evidence for microbial ripped up class and mats embedded within such carbonaceous and siliceous matrix. Likewise, there are also examples of lenticular microfossils. This is one example of a lenticular lens shaped microfossils which is largely made up of carbonaceous matter, matter. This is solitary lensoidal microfossil, which is again shown here on the right extreme portion with the Raman spectroscopic map, mostly demonstrating the carbonaceous content, which is shown here. The bright yellow fringes are representative of the intense content of carbon. Now this is shown with the content of carbon, how it sits with the structure. The structure is lensoidal with smooth walls sometimes, but occasionally they can be discontinuous and with close to about 100 microns, the maximum diameter to 200, which is the maximum that I've observed. Other than lensoidal microfossils, which are solitary, there are also twins and there are doublets of such structures, which is shown here and they are connected with a strand or flange like appendages that are flaring through these structures, flaring out from the radial part of these structures. Now, these are, these are noted from South Africa and Australia and will be discussed in the final part of today's talk. Moving to the northeastern part of the Singum Griton, where we have another example of a greenstone sequence. And we recently published the age and the geology of the upper part of the greenstone sequence from the Gorumishan belt. Now here is a geological map, which is showing the uh, geology roughly where we have greenstone slivers, which are shown here in green colors and intrusion of younger granitoids. Followed by that, we have paleoprotozoic successions flanking on the margins of this granite greenstone terrain. More detailed study, which we conducted on this greenstone sequence, suggested that the rock assemblages that are preserved in this Gorumishan belt are showing preservation of pillow basalts. Now here the pillows are very deformed with Ocelli rearing pillows and agglomerates, which are another set of volcanic rocks that are uh, mostly seen in the Gorumishan belt. Otherwise, we also have altometric rocks which are reported by Chaudhuri et al. in 2017 from the Kapili area. And they discuss the evidence of AL depleted and undepleted variety of Tumatiites from the Kapili area locality. Mostly, therefore, we have aldermatic rocks and pillow basalts, and we have basic volcanic rocks. Now, these volcanic rocks, recently we were able to date, and the date that we obtained was 3.51 billion years. Very similar and un indistinguishable from the dates that were obtained from the southern Princeton belt of the Singbung Britain. More importantly, the Gorumoshan and Princeton belt also hosts carbonaceous. Church. These are carbonaceous banded black and white bedded church, which are cross cut by hydrothermal rain church. These are granular church in nature. Now, these are bedded banded black and white church with church slab conglomerates and typical association of carbonaceous matter. And carbonaceous church are also observed from the Gormushan and Princeton belt. As I was mentioning, that we 
were able to date and establish the age of the Gaumarishan belt for the first time, the report of the age was about 3.51 billion years. These are the zircons that were recovered and the epsilon data will be discussed shortly, which are close to convertic. Otherwise, we also encountered some stenocrysts which were giving us an exact similar age to some stenocrystic age that were discussed from the Sindhurumundi cluster formations that are dating back to 3.53 billion years. Now, together with the Sindhurumundi cluster formation, Plastic rocks, epsilon, hafnium data of the classic volcanic zircons of the Golmoishani belt also suggest that the epsilon data girdles around all chondritic composition. This is again suggestive of the juvenile source for this classic volcanic rocks of the Singum Graton, and thus indicating that roughly at around 3.5 billion years, there was enormous crust formation processes or activities related to crustal formation growth at around 3.5 in the Singum Graton. Together with the greenstone sequence from the Northeast and from the South, we also have greenstone sequence from the South Southeast, which is the Hadugar Noasai greenstone belt. And the Hadugar Noasai greenstone belt is close to the Hadugar Dam near the Salandi River. Now, this greenstone sliver is shown here in green coloration with the younger plastic sedimentary suit, mostly made up of quartzites. Now the greenstone terrain is included by granitoids of younger age and also some intrusions of mafic complexes that are much younger in age. The Hadugar Noasai greenstone belt again is seen to be preserving enormous mafic Ultramafic volcanic rocks. Now here, the mafic volcanic, ultramafic volcanic rocks are highly carbonated and silicified. This is one example of ultramafic carbonated silicified rock from the Hadugar Noasai belt. And otherwise, we have carbonaceous dirts, similar, very similar to those that we have discussed from the Golden and the Daikari belts. And on top of this Princeton sequence, we have the Mahagiri quartzites that are dated at around 3.3 billion years. So this, again, is a classical example of a granite greenstone terrain from the south-southeast of the Sigmund Gritton with abundance of volcanic rocks, mostly submarine mafic volcanics and automafic rocks with carbonaceous church, followed by uncomfortably overlaying Mahagir quartzites on top. Now, from all these greenstone belts, I also conducted the peak metamorphic conditions, meaning that the highest grade of metamorphism that this greenstone belt has suffered and which was recorded by the carbonaceous matter. Now the structure of the D and the G bands here are shown here in different spectra that are reported from the Gorumishani belt for which the estimated geothermometer range was suggested to be 420 to 470 plus minus with an error of 50 degrees. Now this for the dietary belt is seen to be 360 to 440 plus minus 50 degrees. And for the Hadabar Greenstone belt, the Raman spectra shows a slightly higher metamorphic conditions, which we also encounter with the slightly uh, less pronounced and highly uh, developed G band, more steep G band, suggesting of more stacking of carbon bonds here, and therefore suggesting more higher metamorphic grade in the Hadabar Nuasahi area. Now, therefore, all these greenstone belts from Daitari, Gormushani, and, and Noasai, Hadugar area show low to medium to high grade pinches passive conditions, mostly from the green, greenstone belt of Daitari. We have much better preservation of rocks where we have low to medium grade pinches rocks. So, coming to the first slide, and I discussed that. The Paleoarchean greenstone succession of South Africa is always considered as a classical greenstone sequence. And because of its pristine preservation of rocks and the quality of rocks that we can find there. But from India, now I have discussed three classical greenstone successions the Daitari greenstone belt, Gomishan greenstone belt, and the Hadugar Noasai greenstone belt, which show typical archetypal greenstone succession, where we have Komatiites 
that we also see in the Barbudan area of South Africa and commodities that we encounter from the Dajarubinsan belt of South Africa and the Gormushan belt of India. There we have commodities which are spinifex textures and these commodities date back to 3.5 billion years. These are some of the examples of classical commodities from both the cretons. And followed by that, we have examples of submarine mated volcanoes where we have Ocini bearing pillow basalt from Barberton Greenstone Belt, which is shown here in the photograph to the left. And likewise, we have Ocini bearing pillow basalt from the Gorumashani Belt of India. Now, these are indicating that the marine volcanism was very prominent during the Paleoarchean times, and they were mostly submarine in nature. Together with this, we have abundance of Carbonaceous skirts, both from Kaval Kriton, which is recorded from the Bakrit Chert of South Africa, and from Tonka Chert of India, where we have abundance of carbonaceous matter. And followed by that, we have also examples of microbial drift up class in trend within Silicious Carbonaceous Matrix. We have examples of lenticular microfossils recorded from Bakrit Chert of South Africa. And likewise, we have microbial mats. And these are entrained within siliceous and carbonaceous pitch matrix, examples of lenticular lensoidal fossils with an increment of carbonaceous matter reported from India. So these are the examples that are coming from the earliest activity of life that are trapped in as carbonaceous rem remains in some of these carbonaceous skirts. So to wind up the Paleoarchean history of the Sigmund return, and the comparison with the Kapval Graton, the Singum Graton hosts some of the oldest well-preserved submarine volcano sedimentary sequences as old as 2.5 billion years. They are mostly made up of automatic native volcanic rocks, and they are of huge potential for studying earlier mantle conditions. They are excellent repository for the study of earlier surface processes. This Craton because they have good sedimentary rock sequences such as banded black and white church and different variety of church together with silicic acid rocks. Moreover, we have evidence for oldest microbial mats and lenticular microfossils from the Paleoarchean history. Now to study the second part of today's talk or to discuss the second phase of uh, the the discussion today, we would like to knock on this door, which is coming from beautiful house from the Koira area in the Sigmund Graton. And this photograph was taken by me a few days ago, again, when I was in the field. So the Koira group is actually a Mesoarchean Cretonic cover sequence. And how this is different from the Paleoarchean Greenstone sequence that I've discussed so far will be shown in the preceding slides. Now the Koira group, which is shown here, sorry, which is shown here in the Left hand side of the Sigmund Graton is represented here in the geological map. And the Korea group is mostly made up of volcano sedimentary sequence, which are sitting on top of the Bonai granite. Now, the red coloration is for the iron formation and some manganese bearing shales and naked volcanic rocks and some sandstones, which will be discussed in the preceding slides. This is a simple stratigraphic log of the Korea group of rocks which we see that the basement granite is followed by a quartzite conglomerate sequence where we have sandstones and then followed by that we have mafic volcanic rocks which is shown here in green colored portions in the map then we have the iron formation and the magnetic feeding shale from the normundi formation so what are the typical rocks that we encounter in the field we mostly have granites, which I've mentioned are from the Bona area, known as the Bona granite, which are dating back to 2.3 billion years. Then we have cross bedded sandstone, which we recently dated to be at 3.0 billion years from the Topa D formation. Followed by that, we have vesicle field basalt, which are mostly sub aerial in nature now. And uh, then we have carbonates which are associated with stromatolites. Now, these stromatolites are very significant because nowhere in the Paleoarchean greenstone sequence we encountered such stromatolites. 
So the Mesoarchean rock segments from the Goya group host all this rock. And uh, followed by that, we have the Noamundi formation, iron, iron formation, where we have iron ore bearing rocks and manganese bearing shales. So these are the typical rocks that are associated in the Mesoarchean rock assemblage of the Koya group. Now, when we discuss and uh, try to understand the Mesoarchean of the Kavval Kriton and the Sindhum Kriton, now from the Kavval Kriton, Mesoarchean Kritonic cover succession is largely studied from the Pongola supergroup, studied from the Pongola area, and this dates back to 3.0 to 2.8 billion years. The Pongola area, which is shown here in the left hand side, is beautifully exposed in the white anthology in Laya and also in the Buffalo River area. So, at the base of the Pongola supergroup, we have the Suti group, which is mostly made up of marine sub aerial volcanic rocks. And then we have the Mozan group, which is mostly made up of siliciclastic rocks and iron formation. Now, this is one example from the White and area where the rocks are exposed, where the basement granite is at the base of the sequence and followed by that we have sandstones, followed by this we have huge pile of sub aerial mafic volcanic rocks of the Suzy group. Now again, we have beautifully preserved uh, ropey textured lavas and then we have stromatolites from the Pongola supergroup, which are equivalents that we have just seen from the Noamundi formation of the Koira group of India. Therefore, this sequences again from the Mozan group, as we see, host siliciclastic sedimentary rocks such as sandstone, ripple laminated sandstone, as we can see here, and iron formation with enrichment of manganese are classical examples of uh, younger sequence that is now that was now discussed from the Simum Graton and also now observed from the from the Pongola supergroup. So the highlights of the Mesoarchean Aeon of the Singum Graton and the Kaval Graton in similarities is that the Mesoarchean rock assemblage hosts siliciclastic rocks and mostly now the uh, now the volcanic suit are mostly Subaerial in nature. There are no more submarine volcanic rocks, and we have stromatolites, we have low grade, very low grade metamorphic rocks, and in the Singum Graton, we have huge, enormous reserves of iron and manganese hosted within the Koira group from the western part of the Singum Graton. Now, before the sun sets in South Africa, I would like to proceed to the final phase of today's talk where I discuss the present. Uh, project that I am undergoing at Bits University, and I will be working on the oldest evidence of microbial diverse life hosted from three cretons, and for which I will be working on the Pilbara creton from Western Australia, the Kapval creton from South Africa, and the Simum creton from India, where we have enormous reserves of banded black and white chert, as you can see in the photograph. Carbonaceous matter is abundant in these church, which host the earliest traces of life. When we say the earliest traces of life, so far we know that life was there, and there are some signals which have been argued for different activities of life. Now, when we start to discuss this from India, we have lenticular microfossils with carbonaceous structures that are globular in nature, sitting within this large spheroid and forming a larger aggregate. Followed by that, we have colonial assemblages together linked, connected with clusters or clots of carbonaceous matter. And these are individual spheroids or microfossils connected by strands, and they form colony or clusters. Together with that, in the Buckley Church area, we have examples of ripped up microbial mat like laminations. And these are examples from South Africa. Followed by that, we have filamentous structures discussed from the kangaroo caves formation of uh, Australia and carbonaceous spheroids from the kangaroo caves formation. 
Thereafter, we have a ferrite of the Kluta formation from Moody's group of Southern Africa, dated at around 2.2 billion years. And followed by that, we have carbonaceous or microstructures, cellular microstructures discussed from the Dixon Island formation from Western Australia. So the emphasis of this slide is to show you the abundance of colonial linkage and association of all these microfossils right from 3.5 from India, South Africa, and Australia. Therefore, we have taphonomic morphological signatures of life that was abundant during the Paleoarchean to Mesoarchean time in these three cretons. With the biological morphology that we observed, there was also uh, different evidence that suggests that metabolism was very important and crucial for early life to survive and how they exist. So there are examples that the evolution of the first isotrophy or possible uh, clues for methanogens to have existed at around 3.46 billion years. Then we have the first evidence of last universal common ancestor at around 2.4 billion years from the rock record of Pilbara. We have examples of Kelvin cycle from, again, from the Moody's group. And then we have oxygenic photosynthesis a uh, strong evidence of oxygenic photosynthesis and cyanobacteria from the Congola uh, area. So these are examples of different metabolic pathways and also organisms that may have used different kinds of metabolism to survive. And this, I call it 500 million years of biological insurgence. The reasons for this are very simple because we see examples from morphology, which shows us planktonic, possible planktonic microorganisms, which are shown here, now from India, Australia, and South Africa, as in lenticular microfossils. We have stromatolites, which are possibly benthic dwellers. Then we have uh, benthic subspread dwellers at around 3.2 billion years from the Moody's group, where we also have spread microstructures. And then we have colonial cellular tiny microstructures linked with some strands. And these are examples of diverse microbes linked together somehow in colonies. And with that, there are enough of morphological plus metabolic geochemical information which suggests that life was abundant during the Archean. And this well can be coined as biological innovations for about 500 million years. And with that, I like to imagine us with an Archean earth where we have the Archean early earth bombarded with intense UV radiations, meteorite showers, and with no ozone, with a month abundance of volcanic emissions, the conditions were very sterilizing. However, life was pretty much there in the form of benthic microbes, which we have seen in the form of stromatolites. Also, maybe there were planktonic microbiota, such as lenticular spindle-shaped microorganisms that we have discussed and seen so far from the tree and therefore I, I see life very abundant in marine environments which were shielding from different uh, natural calamities and now when we are standing at such exciting times to search for any extraterrestrial life from Venus or it can be the moon of Saturn where we have examples of Venusian cloud hosting traces of possible life or even it can be the macromolecular organic compounds coming from the um, coming from the Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. This very presentation shows that there are enough to be done on our very own Earth, where the early Earth history itself can be used to explore for any other extraterrestrial life, if there is any. But the first place to look for is our own very own Earth. And with that, there is a very special take home message that the Paleoarchean greenstone sequence of India hosts Comatiaids, Pilobesols, and Banded Black and White Church, which are typical of Paleoarchean in age. The Lutetium Hafim data suggests the involvement of mostly juvenile sources at around 3.5 billion years. There are excellent preservation of carbonaceous matter, which hosts microbial mat and lenticular microfossils. When we talk about cartonic cover sequences, we have mesoarchian stromatolites recorded both from India and South Africa. 
and in India, we have enormous reserves, economically viable, and are being mined for iron and manganese for over decades. Therefore, the Mesozoic in cryptomic cover sequence is of huge potential for earlier surface processes. Therefore, the Archean Singum Craton is an excellent reserve to study earlier processes. And with that, it's also very significant to study astrobiological research in the future. With that, I leave you all with this beautiful slide where I always imagine that the early Earth was like, and our possible ancestors were having some coffee or drinks, sitting in some beach here. And the, even if they were not carrying the much toxic or sterilizing environments. And likewise, we should not be bo bothered with the COVID <laughs> and other viruses, but be more strong and resilient. So with that, I leave you with this strong message and thank you for, for inviting me to today's talk. And uh, I especially thank the uh, hosts and different institutes and organizations that have funded me during the course of my studies and so that we could continue this research and the people of Singum and different other mining companies from the Singum area that provided us uh, with some facilities during this study. Thank you. Jagamoy, thank you so much. That was a uh, very detailed, very fascinating and very comprehensive uh, presentation and research. And clearly a very, very um, comprehensive PhD. So well done and thank you for that. Um, I can see we have some hands raised already from the audience. Okay. So, um, Sharad, has, Sharad Master has raised his hand. Sharad, thanks for joining us. I'm going to allow you to talk and you just need to unmute yourself, Sharad, then you uh, can talk. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Sharad. Okay. Um, yeah, firstly, I'd like to congratulate uh, Jagan Moy on an excellent talk. Uh, fantastic. New data, and I uh, really look forward to seeing all your papers coming out of this. Um, I just want to um, ask a question about the, um, the metamorphic conditions that you, uh, you calculated from carbonaceous matter in the three greenstone belts that you discussed, which were about 3.51 billion years old. Uh, and in particular, uh, I'm quite interested in the fact that you found um, higher metamorphic uh, temperatures for the Hadgar uh, greenstone belt, which is the one, the third one that you, you uh, looked at, the last one. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so uh, compared to the, uh, the temperatures that you find in the other areas, this is uh, significantly higher, you know, uh, up to 100 uh, degrees uh, yeah. uh, higher temperatures than in the other places. I just want to point out to you, uh, and something you didn't mention in your talk, but uh, you can see this on the slide that you've got the Shimlipal group. Uh, it's just below the, the bottom left corner of the, uh, of, of the explanation in, in, your, in your map. It says Shimlipal group. It's a big circular feature. Sure. And that is uh, a, a meso, it's also a Mesoarchean succession of volcanics and, and quartzites that's shown on this map as yellow and green. Yellow are the quartzites, there are three quartzite bands and, and uh, the green is volcanics. Um, and I've been investigating this for the last couple of years and I presented the first evidence that it was a possibly a meteorite impact structure. And yeah. uh, this yeah. has now been proven. There is a paper that's in press now in the Journal of the Geological Society of India, where they found the first evidence for shocked zircons and even coesite. So it's definitely yeah. been proven to be an impact structure. And mm -hmm. uh, notice that your greenstone fragment, uh, the um, Hadgar, is the one that is closest to the edge of this impact structure. So I uh, suspect that um, this met higher metamorphism may have something to do with this, uh, this impact, which is dated now at about 3.08 billion years. And I will be presenting this at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in two weeks time. Uh, it will be an online conference. Yes. Yes, thanks for your input, Sharon. I've been, I've, I've known that this uh, Simbipal complex, I mean, of course, there are previous studies and also recent study, there are two Gambian research paper published from the Simbipal now that have shown that the age of the Simbipal group. Well, the, Aspect of impact crater, I would not go detail into that because I have not studied the simplify myself. 
but to uh, discuss the hybrid metamorphic imprint, which is recorded in the Noah Sahi and the Hadugar Bell. This, um, I'm, I'm sure there are many events that happen. And as you know, that these uh, granite greenstone terrains are intruded by numerous granitoids, as you can see, the latest of which is the Mayur Bhans granite, which is at around 3.08 billion years. And around about the same time, we have aldomatic complexes, which are shown here in purple, which are also intrus intrusive events. Now, these are big events that were uh, discussed, that were shown from the Singum these are These are everywhere in the Singum Kriton. So from my perspective, this, uh, I can also show you maybe one slide. So yes, this is the Bola complex, and which is again, uh, ultramafic mafic complex, which is shown to host some platinum, platinum group of elements. So I would suspect that most of the events apart from Grinch's passive metamorphism later on, after the quartzite conglomerate sequence deposition took place and the stabilization of the crust there were many other events that led to the metamorphic grade, and maybe one of it could be your very own special impact related story. And yeah, this could be one probable, probable reason because it's close to it, probably that may have contributed, but I'm not sure of the impact. I've read this paper from the Journal of Geological Society with Ajay Singh, and uh, yeah, it looks that they have found some evidence. I'm sure also you may have recorded some of your shatter cones in one abstract that was published in this lunar planetary science uh, talk. So yeah, I'm looking forward to your papers <laughs> on the single impact story. Thank you, Jagamoy. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sharon. We've got another question from uh, Robert Smith that's in the Q&A and that is, has any microbial life been detected in Canada that you know of? Well, this is a very broad question. So, uh, so microbial life in Canada. So now the time scale is what we were discussing today was from Belioarchian to Mesoarchian. Now there are many examples of uh, of such, but the most controversial of all, I would say, yes, there are examples of uh, from the from the Nuba area. I think it was in 2017, the Dodd et al. published some microbial filamentous tubular structures from the Nuvagitu place. So yeah, I think that's the closest that it can get in terms of ancient earliest traces of life. Now there are several others which it comes in terms of geochemical evidences and yes, there are abundance of life in form of chemical evidences that are reported from the Abitabi Greenstone, Abitigi Greenstone Belt which is roughly around 2.7 billion years. So yeah, Canada also hosts some of the earliest places of Archean life, yes. Okay, great. Thank you for that question, Robert. Are there any other questions? Any other hands? Um, yes, I see a question from Morris. Morris, you can just unmute. Yes, can, yes, Morris Fulian here, yeah. can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, I read it. Uh, thanks very much for the interesting talk. It's a subject that um, you know, Richard and myself have been have thought about you know, for many years since our, our work in the Barberton area. And uh, just one quick uh, point or question or your thoughts on the, on the following, and that is that um, you, you stress the early commodities and then the emergence of life. You, at, at one stage, you also briefly mentioned some of the elements that uh, are related to some kind of exhalative volcanic activity. But I'd just like to pose the question, um, this the carbonaceous material presumably was more plant-like and and if it, that, that is the case, it would have had some chlorophyll and uh, chlorophyll is magnesium based. And of course, commodities are in, in, very enriched in magnesium and iron for that matter. And I'm just wondering if uh, in fact, that might've been quite an important factor in an enabling this early plant life to develop the presence of the, this high magnesium environment, possibly derived from the, the pelagenetic, pelagenetic chill material of some of the commodiatic flows. So uh, uh, just your thoughts on the kind of elements that were around in that environment that enabled this early life to develop. Yes, thank you, Maurice, for your question. 
and uh, yeah um, so to answer this question uh, well i'm not sure if this slide was planned like but what i discussed is that we have evidence for microstructures which is shown here these are all cellular microstructures and they are reported from south africa australia and now from india now with regards to the composition of the pomatiites and how this would be sourced to this um, rocks that host uh, these structures so i would like to emphasize that this traces of life comes from the tonka formation which is shown here towards uh, on the left hand side in the stratigraphic log and uh, which is the uppermost part of the sedimentary suit now of course there could be some wind blown or some you know terrestrial sources that could have led to some pomatiate ash into this into this chert or even the silicoclastic underneath but mostly what we observe from the silicoclastic rocks of the uh, sindhirumundi formation as i've mentioned is that they are derived from the erosion of the felsic volcanic rocks so the biggest component that we see in the silicoclastic rocks is of felsic volcanic detritus much unlikely to be a pomatiatic source nevertheless i don't this uh, i don't um, see any reason that there would be any pomatiatic uh, you know detritus that could be reworked from the underlying uh, pomatiate and could be sourced for the microbes that may have survived on this uh, nutrients so yeah possibility is there but most importantly the factor that uh, played was that there may have been some prominent source from the underlying felsic volcanic rock which yeah maybe there is also a part of pomatiatic or mafic source detritus that led to some nutrient supply and yeah magnesium and the other clues that you have pointed could be one reason otherwise i see that there are other metals that can come from pomatiate or mafic rocks such as nickel which is mostly supported for metabolic pathways as an enzyme and nickel is one contributing factor so yeah nickel i would suggest is the biggest metal that can aid to such kind of nutrients and yeah that has been discussed by many many geochemists and earlier scientists to act as one one uh, nutrient or uh, one uh, one such source of metal nutrient source from different areas of the rtm so yeah i would suggest maybe pomatiate acted as a source huh. thank you thank you maurice all right i saw a hand come up from george henry george do you have a question that you want to ask just raise your hand george then i can uh, give you the floor Ah, okay, he's asked in the Q and A. So George Henry asks, "Thanks for the great talk, Dragon Boy. How did the manganese deposits form?" The manganese deposits. Uh, so um, the manganese deposits of the. Okay, so let's see if you are. Okay, I don't know if you can see my slides. Let's just come on. Yeah, we so can see you. Yes. So. Yeah, let me go to the manganese and enrichment. So actually, the manganese story is slightly different, and uh, <clears throat> much of this work remains to be done. So uh, so far, not much has been done. And uh, interesting story is that we discovered this rock. Previously, there are many discoveries which mention their uh, their positioning in the western part of the Singhum Craton, and the formation of these rocks are yet to be studied. That is what we can say because. This is just the preliminary reports that this Mesoargean Cretonic cover sequence hosts iron and manganese, and now how they form will be will be established only once somebody studies this. Maybe it's me or maybe it's George who will be interested to study these rocks. <laughs> Great. Okay. Good. Good answer, Jagamo. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to end off. It. If anyone has any other questions, please raise your hand. But I'm going to ask one last question, Jagamoy, if there aren't any other questions. Yep. And this might be a little bit of an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Okay. Um, Go ahead. You've got an interesting catalog of, of Archean formations that span what is turning out to be a really important uh, 
transition in Earth's history, uh, where people yes. are recognizing big changes in continental crust composition and potentially geodynamic processes. Do you yes. see any evidence for major changes in tectonic processes or geodynamic processes in the areas that span the 500 million years of history? Yeah, but I mean, if you, well, this is a very interesting and a very <laughs> good question. So when we talk about this 500 million years, as I've mentioned, this is a very interesting time, as you have pointed out. And we see many different metabolisms and pathways and different diversities of microbes from that aspect. And uh, yeah, geodynamic conditions certainly change. And like I've mentioned that in the Mesoarchean time, we always have seen much shallow marine terrestrial sedimentary rock sequences, whereas in the Paleoarchean, we have much deep water and uh, some marine mafic volcanic rocks. So from this very evidence, sorry, there is a very strong case that we can understand is that there was a shift from different uh, conditions such as also, also very big example is that also mafic lavas are absent. I mean, they're absent from the Mesoarchean rock record from India at least. And the Paleoarchean host mostly ultramatic commodity lava. So there was different rock assemblages that I've mentioned. And this definitively indicates that the Mesoarchean Paleoarchean time has, has seen a very strong or case of uh, geodynamic setting that changed. And when this happened, nobody knows, or I don't know at least. But yeah, definitely there are very strong indicators such as volcanic rocks, deep marine settings of sedimentation, and then life and evolution of different metabolic pathways. So I see that there is a very big, big transition and rightly pointed out that it, it is a very big topic of discussion. So yeah, but yes, from this evidence that there were commodities and deep marine settings from the Paleoarchian sequence, we can point out that the Paleoarchian was different and the Mesoarchean was completely different. And yes, there was a change in the tectonic regime altogether. Great, well, thank you very much, Jack. And I don't see any more questions uh, from the audience. So it just leaves me to thank you for a very, very interesting talk and wish you all the best for your postdoc research here at WITS. It certainly sounds uh, very cross disciplinary, which is important. Uh, sure. I'm gonna end off just by sharing my screen. Um, yes. Thank you. Just to, remind, so stay online, Jack, and just to remind yeah. everyone um, of the talk next week. So we have uh, Lachelle Goslin, who was a who was an MSc student here several years ago um, and graduated recently. And she'll be talking about unraveling complexities of the basement core domes of the southern central zone of the Damara. So that should be a very interesting talk. And we hope you'll join us for that. And then if anyone would like to uh, stay online for a bit of uh, virtual social networking, you, you're welcome to. Um, if you do want to stay on and, and ask more questions of Jaganmoy or just chat with uh, colleagues that you haven't seen for a while, then just uh, raise your hand and um, we'll uh, permit you to be a panelist and then we can have a nice uh, casual discussion at the end. Otherwise, we'll see you all next week and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.